Hello, in this video we're going to go over an algebra problem from IMO 2011. Determine all sequences x1, x2 all the way to x2011 of positive integers such that for every positive integer n, there is an integer a with this equality. So as usual, I'm going to walk you through the process by which I obtain the solution, which means some of the stuff I'm going to talk about may not be in a solution. Okay, so the first thing was I was trying to find one solution to this equation and it wasn't clear to me what solution we have to this equation. So I decided to replace 2011 with the small values to see if we can find some solutions and hopefully we can find some solution to this. We can guess a solution to this and then we can find all solutions so naturally I'm going to start from 1 so I have x1 to the power of n is equal to a to the power of n plus 1 plus 1 in the process I kept thinking this a doesn't depend on n so to be clear I'm going to replace a by a sub n so that I know this actually depends on n okay so what I did was I moved one to the other side and notice that x1 is fixed but a n depends on n and I factor this I get x1 minus 1 x1 to the power of n minus 1 all the way to x1 plus 1 is equal to a n to the power of n plus 1 now I have the product of these two numbers is an n plus first power so if they are relatively prime then they both have to be n plus first power let's find the GCD of these two so what is the GCD of x1 minus 1 and x1 to the power of n minus 1 all the way to 1? Well, in order to find GCD, I'm going to take the second expression mod x1 minus 1. So I'm going to take x1 to the power of n minus 1 all the way to 1. And I'm going to take that mod x1 minus 1. Mod x1 minus 1, x1 is 1, so it's the sum of n ones, which is n. So if I make sure that n and uh, x1 minus 1 are, re are relatively prime, so if GCD of x1 minus 1 and n is 1, then I would know that um, x1 minus 1 would have to be some number, some integer to the power of n plus 1. Now, of course, this cannot happen for every n. Um, so if that does happen for every n, it means two things. Either x1 minus 1 is 0 or x1 minus 1 is 1, which means x1 is 1 or 2. Let's try both of them. For x1 equals 1, I have 1 to the n, which is in fact equal to 0 to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. So I have this equality. So there is a solution for x1 equals 1. And for x1 equals 2, I have 2 to the n must be equal to a n to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. That doesn't happen because if you look at 2 squared, 2 squared is not a, an integer cubed plus 1. So that doesn't work. So the only solution for 1 is x1 equals 1. Now, once you look at uh, uh, 2, you get x1 to the power of n plus 2x2 to the power of n. That's going to be equal to some a n to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. So for every n, there's an integer a n that we have this equality. Now, if I move 1 to the other side, there is no easy way of factoring this one. So I didn't really see any easy way of factoring and using a similar idea. So at this point, I decided I have to use a different approach. But looking back at the solution that we had, this really wasn't possible because x1 minus 1 cannot be an n plus first power for every n, which means if I know x1 minus 1 is an n plus first power for large values of n, that would give me a contradiction or it would give me only limited possibilities. So because of that, I decided to look at the behavior of both sides for large n. So what happens for large n? So there are three possibilities. If x1 is greater than x2, then the dominant term on the left is x1 to the power of n. The dominant term on the right is a n to the power of n plus 1. And this would have to be true for all large n which means this is only possible when x1 is equal to a n 
uh, is equal to 1 because you can write this down as a n to the power of n times a n. So I have to like make this a bit more rigorous, but that's like basically the idea. If x1 is equal to x2, then on the left, I get 3x1 to the power of n. That's going to be a n to the power of n plus 1. And this is for large n. And this is only valid when x1 is equal to a n is equal to 3. And if x1 is less than x2, then the dominant term on the left is 2x2 to the power of n. That's going to be a n to the power of n plus 1, which means x2 must be equal to a n must be equal to 2. So let's see um, if that's possible. So in the first case, we have 1 to the power of n plus 2 times x2 to the power of n is equal to 1 to the power of n plus 1 plus 1, and that obviously isn't possible. In the second case, I have 3 to the power of n plus 2 times 3 to the power of n is equal to 3 to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. That's obviously also not possible. In the third case, I get 2 to the power of n plus 2 times, or rather, 1 to the power of n. Because x1 is less than x2, it has to be 1. But I'm going to keep it this way for now. This is 2 to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. So that means x1 is 1 and x2 is 2. So I get this equality. Now I have to make this a bit more rigorous because now I made the uh, I made the conclusion here that x1 must be 3 and I made the conclusion here that x2 must be 2. So why is it the case that if 3x1 to the power of n asymptotically is the same as a n to the power of n plus 1, then x1 and a n must both be 3. So why is it the case that x1 and a n must be the same if 3x1 to the power of n is the same as asymptotically a n to the power of n plus 1? Well, let's see what happens if a n is greater than x plus x1. If a n is greater than x1, a n is at least x1 plus 1 which means a n to the power of n plus 1 is at least x1 plus 1 to the power of n plus 1, which is x1 to the power of n plus 1 plus n plus 1, x1 to the power of n plus stuff. And that is greater than 3x1 to the power of n. So asymptotically, it grows faster. So that's not possible. And similarly, if x1 is greater than a n, then we have something very similar. So we have x1 is at least a n plus 1, raise it to the power of n, and you get some contradiction again. So here, um, that means x1 and a n must be the same. And because these two are asymptotically the same, x1 and a n must be equal to 3. You can let n go to infinity, and that would give you a, uh, the final result. Similar for the next one. And if you look at 3 instead of 2011, you get something very similar. So now let's see what we can come up with. So if you look back at the two examples that we did, both of them had x1 equals 1. So if you look at this one, 2011, x sub 2011 to the power of n equals a n to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. If you look at x1 equals 1 and x2 equals x2011 equals a constant and plug it in you get 1 plus 2 plus 2011 times c to the n equals a n to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. So if you take c to be equal to this so if you take a n equals c equals 2 plus 2011 then we have a solution. So there is one solution, x1 equals 1, and x2 equals x3 equals x2011 equals that sum, which is 2013 times 2010 over 2. So this is a solution. Now we want to show that this is in fact the only solution. Okay, so because a n depends on n, I can't really let n go to infinity and assume that for every um, a n uh, for every n I know exactly what a n is so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that a n is greater than the maximum 
of x1 through xn because that's the term that is going to determine the uh, dominant term on the left side, which I'm going to call that n. So assume this is true for infinitely many n. If that's the case, then for those n, a n is greater than or equal to n plus 1. So that means a n to the power of n plus 1 is greater than or equal to n plus 1 to the power of n plus 1, which is m to the power of n plus 1 plus n plus 1, m to the power of n plus etc. And that's greater than n plus 1 to the power of n for infinitely many n. So here's the situation now. We have x1 to the n, 2x2 to the n, all the way to 2011. x2011 to the power of n is equal to a n to the power of n plus 1 plus 1, and that's more than n plus 1 m to the n. And this inequality is true for infinitely many n. Now, on the left, we have x1 to the power of n, 2x2 to the power of n, all the way to 2011, x2011 to the power of n. This is less than. I'm going to replace each one of the x1, x2, all the way to x2011 by m. So I get m to the n, and I'm going to less than. It would be less than or equal to 2m to the n all the way to 2011, m to the power of n, which means n plus 1, m to the n, is less than or equal to 1 plus 2 all the way to 2011, times m to the power of n for infinitely many n. And that means I get n plus 1 is less than I go to 12011, which is not possible. So this cannot be true for infinitely many values of n. So that means that a n is less than I call to m for all n after some point. So there's some positive integer that after that point, a n is less than or equal to m. Now we're going to show that a n is in fact equal to m. So suppose uh, a n is less than m for infinitely many n. Now we're going to do something similar. So we'll have to show the left side and the right side asymptotically do not match on the left side, we have x1 to the power of n all the way to 2011, x2011 to the power of n. This is greater than or equal to m to the power of n. On the right side, a n to the power of n plus 1 plus 1 is less than or equal to m minus 1 to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. And this is true for infinitely many n. Now, what that means is that for those values of n, m to the power of n is less than or equal to m minus 1 to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. So now we can divide both sides by m and see what happens to the power of n. We get m minus 1 over m to the power of n times m minus 1 and then plus 1 over m to the power of n. Now, as m goes to infinity, this goes to 0. Now, this one goes to 0 if m is more than 1. So this goes to 0 if m is at least 2. And that is a contradiction. So that means either m equals 1 or a n equals m for all n greater than or equal to n. Let's see what happens if m is 1. If m is 1, that means x1 through xn are all equal to 1 and also we know that a n is less than 1 for infinitely many values of n and that's not possible because a n becomes 0 and this equality doesn't hold the equality that they gave us. The last thing is a n is equal to m. This is for all n after some point. Now we're going to take this one and plug it into equation so we get x1 to the n all the way to 2011, x2011 to the power of n is equal to m to the power of n plus 1 plus 1. Now let's assume that xi1 through xik 
are all equal to m these are the maximum and xj is less than m for every j that is not inside the set i1 through ik so we're going to divide both sides by m to the power of n so we get the sum i l l equals 1 to k those terms are going to become 1 plus the sum j x j over m to the power of n j not equal to i l that's equal to m plus 1 over m to the power of n now if you look at x j over m x j over m is less than or equal to m minus 1 over m which means x j over m to the power of n approaches 0 so as n approaches 0 and we also know that m is more than 1 we discussed why m is more than 1 so this approaches 0 which means the sum of i l l equals 1 to k is equal to m and if we take that and plug it into the original equation we get sum of i l l equals 1 to k times x i l to the power of n plus the sum of j x j to the power of n is equal to m to the power of n plus 1 plus 1 and this one j is not i l now this guy is going to be the sum of i l l equals 1 to k times m to the power of n which is in fact m to the power of n plus 1 which means the sum of j x j to the power of n is equal to 1 so what does that mean it means i1 through ik must be 2 through 2011 because there's no way that this equality holds unless there is just one j and that is j equals 1 so that's the case and also x1 equals 1 so what does it mean it means x1 is 1 and x2 all the way to x2011 are the same and we saw earlier that this is only possible if the sum is 2013 times 2011 2010 divided by 2. So that is the only solution to this problem. And that brings me to the end of this video. So I will see you in the next video.